discussion today. I, Ms. Anita Singh, Assistant Professor of Law at Hidayatullah National Law University, welcome you all to this virtual dais of the XRK webinar organized on the occasion of International Human Rights Day. We are blessed to have amongst us today our chief guest, Professor Dr. R. Venkata Rao, former Vice Chancellor and analyst IU Bangalore, who would be delivering the keynote address on human rights in a multipolar world. We also have amongst us our guest of honor, Professor Jalas Subhan, head School of Law at ITM University, and Professor Saloni Tyagi, head Faculty of Law, Kalinga University, Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan, Honorable Vice Chancellor of HNLU, Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, Registrar of HNLU, and Dr. Deepak Srivastava, Dean UG Law at HNLU. We proceed with today's session. May I now invite Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, Registrar of HNLU, to deliver the welcome address. Sir. Yeah, thank you, Professor Nita. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, it's uh, Indeed, a matter of great uh, privilege and honor for the family of Hidatullah National Law University to welcome Professor R. Venkata Rao, My privilege. chief guest of the event, uh, who has a very accomplished uh, career, and we look forward for uh, such deliberation on a very contemporary topic where Sir is going to speak on human rights in multipolar world. Sir, welcoming you on behalf of HNLU family. Thank you. I also take this opportunity to welcome two of our guests of honors uh, from neighboring universities, uh, ITM University uh, Head School of Law, uh, Professor Suhan, and uh, Evening, sir. Head Thank of you School so of Law of uh, Kalinga University School of Law, Professor Tyagi. Along with that, I also welcome all my colleagues who have joined this event this evening and, and uh, all the events who have uh, joined this uh, program where we are commemorating the acceptance and adoption of uh, UDHR and we are celebrating International Human Rights Day. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Prasanita. And also, let me also welcome uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor V.C. Vivekanandan. Sir, thank you for joining and uh, uh, Sir will be delivering opening remark for this session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. HNLU is blessed to have as its helm a renowned academician and administrator par excellence, Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan, as its Honorable Vice Chancellor. Sir has over three decades of teaching and research experience in legal education, particularly IP and Internet law, and has served at NLS Bangalore and Nalsar Hyderabad. He has also he was also the dean at Rajiv Gandhi School of IP Law at IIT Kharagpur and was also the founding dean of School of Law at Bennett University at Greater Noida. At HNLU, Sir has been spearheading numerous initiatives aimed towards ensuring that HNLU makes a mark at the international legal community. Sir, I now invite you to share your opening, opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Ms. Anita. It's a pleasure uh, of uh, hosting this uh, online program today in the absence of students around uh, in the campus. So we thought uh, we will again uh, do this online. And I'm happy today that we are again partnering with uh, two law schools in Raipur, uh, the School of Law ITM and School of Law Kalinga. And the Dean of uh, School of ITM was already present with us about a couple of weeks back in our auditorium for a program and the other dean is also joined today. I welcome both of them uh, to have more partnership with us. And uh, also, uh, I would like to welcome today's chief guest, uh, Professor Venkat Rao. It, has, it is always a delight to listen to uh, Professor Venkat Rao, who, whom I consider is a, a very uh, Kind of a natural speaker in the sense to oh, prepare and come and there are people who weave it according the occasion how to take it and i always felt uh, it was a delight and pleasure uh, listening to professor venkatra especially this title of human rights when we come today that's a very more apt thing in a multipolar world was the title and what better than a professor of international 
you know, law could, you know, weave this, uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, direction which is heading. I also take this to welcome my uh, colleagues here, students from uh, HNLU, students from ITM and uh, <coughs> students from Kalinga participating. My job is much <coughs> less in terms of kind of laying down some problems. As we all know that uh, the word human rights is a buzzword today's world. And even uh, you ask a school kindergarten student, four year, five year, they will even talk about human rights in a family. So as a as a term, this is a kind of a term which is bandied everywhere. And uh, if you look at the history of this human rights as uh, uh, as a term, etc., it it is uh, it is uh, less than a hundred years old in one sense. The way it is getting institutionalized and the way it's getting implemented, we all know that it was originally not even individual human rights. It is collective human rights with the Versailles Treaty during the First World War, which uh, could not really succeed because major powers, especially United States, was not even willing to accept that as a part of its foreign policy. Then with the United Nations forming with the second major world war where they realized there can never be a space for a third world war, probably dawned on them that coming out of their uh, own narrower interest, many nation states it took it up. And this is where even though we talk about individual human rights uh, was something which is coming to the fore with the United Nations coming in place and then it's done. And when you look at uh, the chart and what are the balance sheet of human rights, I would say it is the most, uh, you know, uh, in one way, it is not even half glass full or rather it is, it is not even visible sometimes in a glass of water uh, or full of violation of human rights. But uh, nevertheless, we are today commemorating Human Rights Day, because as you said, one thing is, if you look at uh, philosophically, life is a continuous battle between justice and injustice. Whether it be an individual, be a group, be a uh, society, it is a continuous battle of just and unjust. The biggest problem is what is just, what is unjust. And this is where what you call as human rights will get crushed, because what I consider as a just thing, what is unjust to you, and then we need to resolve this. And quite often, the casualty is human dignity in an individual level, in a group level, in a country level. And this is something uh, continuing throughout the centuries. Probably, we might even say the damage quotient may be slightly less compared to what was in medieval times and to now. That could be only solace, what we can have in terms of that. But as you said, this is a continuous battle which one has to, you know, uh, go uh, go on with that. If I I used to get um, kind of a, uh, a blog from a person from Vietnam who talks about human rights. Very interesting one. Uh, he, he just writes. And one, I used to save all that and keep it even though uh, my subject matter was more on commercial laws. This used to interest me. So I was just reading some time back when I saved one which I thought will be handy for us to, for my opening remarks. It, it, this blog, this author writes, there are, he quotes three social reformers and how the relevant they are today in context of human rights. One of the, this, this, this author's take, which I found interesting to share with you. One is Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, the sociologist. Antonio Gramsci, he says, the need to struggle is actually a built-in principle of human rights. He says human rights is not uh, a gift which is going to come from heaven, but rather <laughs> a need of struggle, which is an inbuilt principle. It is not the nice guys who bring about social change. Nice guys look nice because they are confirming. We cannot face heavy artillery with water guns. Struggle is also a principle of development work overall. To be is to do. The focus must be on the results, not dogma. This is one thought. The second thought is social contract. As proposed in the, you know, almost 17th century by moral philosopher Thomas Hobbes to be understood as, quote unquote, keeping the promise. That's what Hobbes says. It is therefore comes an obligation 
therein lies the relationship within human rights. It is to keep the promise, which means it is not a given thing. So this is a second strand of thought. Third one to remember today is the famous, or you would call nowadays very infamous Marx, Karl Marx, and his thesis where he says, reinterpreting, not changing the world. I repeat, interpreting, not changing the world for scholars. So human right activism, human right practice not to be actively engaged in a luxury we cannot afford what is required for all these colleagues and ourselves this author says is to adapt a realistic approach that embraces experimentation gradual transformation hybrid solutions ecosystems and socio-structural paths so this is what you call as die hard human right activist you can call it do that so if I'm going to link it with today's topic, which uh, we are all eagerly looking at the tapestry, which uh, Professor Venkatra will weave us, I would rather quote a couple of things to finish my opening remarks. This is by Stephen Hopgood in his work, The End Times of Human Rights. is a book, 2013, Itaka in Cornell publication, University Press does this. The quote is very apt. The Second World War and the Holocaust gave irresistible impetus to institutional innovation. The shock of a world destroyed saw advocates redouble their efforts to restore the authority of humanist institutions via the Genocide Convention, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of Nuremberg, and the idea of crimes against humanity as a justiciable international law through the Geneva Conventions of 1949. So this is a game changer what he says everybody spoke spoke but finally when everybody out to jump into act he talked it should be in a very very macro level an institutional level that is what we are talking international law and then whatever could be the outcome of that but the effort has to be humongous on this it was also during if you look at from 1949 a take of last 70 years last 20 years you would have seen the human rights was speaking on one side in terms of advocacy, despite atrocities in Yugoslavia, in Rwanda, in I am talking about which grabs the headlines. I am not talking about still which is tucked inside the second page, third page of newspapers. So we are really finding the installation of the Office of United Nations High Commissioner of Human Rights in 93, the International Criminal Tribunals of Yugoslavia in 93, and in Rwanda in 1994, Rome Statute in 1998, which gave to International Criminal Court in 2002. So if you really look throughout 90s, non-state actors promoting human rights have become more and more influential in shaping today's human rights discourse. International NGOs such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch helped with the architecture and construction of global institutions. So, and at the same time, on the critical side, the one of the eminent political scientist, Samuel Huntington says, quote unquote, quote, hypocrisy, double standards, but nots are the price of universalist pretensions. Democracy is promoted, but not if it brings Islamic fundamentalists to power. Non-proliferation is preached for Iran and Iraq, but not for Israel. Free trade is the elixir of economic growth, but not for agriculture. Human rights are an issue for China, but not with Saudi Arabia. Aggression against oil owning Kuwaitis is massively repulsed, but not against not all oil owning Bosnians. Double standards in practice are the unavoidable price of universal standards of principle. This is coming from one of the, you know, uh, a famous you know, theorist of our times, Samuel Eddington, this is uh, not, uh, not, not, uh, not my quote in the sense, probably this is a very apt quote. Any one of us will be really looking and watching around the world about on one side, our aspiration for human rights and also how institutionally, internationally, how human rights uh, comes into practice or how it is being practiced. So this is well summed up. So in, uh, in a sense, as I said, uh, even in the other day on Legal Services Day, that it is very, very simple that these days of, you know, of why we do this is very simple. After all, 
without hope for his life. And so in that context, this is reaffirmation of hope of whatever we consider is the path. As you said, it is, it, it is, uh, it, it, or if you have to quote, you know, Nehru uh, or, you know, other poets before us, it is miles to go, miles to go before we sleep. And probably this is one day symbolically we think and rededicate ourselves as uh, legal institutions and uh, future thought leaders who are coming from our law schools should reaffirm themselves about the gains which we, uh, what about minuscule gains of human rights and rededicate how it could be individually in our practice and institutionally how this could be strengthened. So with this, uh, I would like to leave the floor to the anchor uh, uh, trying to listen to our chief guest today. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. May I now invite on this virtual dais, Professor Jalis Subhan, sir, our guest of honor for today's program. Mr. Jalis Subhan is the head of the Department of Faculty of Law, ITM University, Raipur. Before joining ITM University, he has served as the head of the institution of Amity Law School, Amity University, Chhattisgarh from 2015 to 2022. He has also worked as an assistant professor at Amity Law School in Gurgaon. He has done his law from Ravishankar Shukla University, Raipur, and master's from NLIU uh, Bhopal, and is currently pursuing his PhD from NLIU Bhopal. Sir, may I now invite you to address the gathering? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. A respected Vice Chancellor, sir. A respected Venkatar Rao, respected deans, teachers of Hidayatullah National Law University. I should thank the organizing team for giving me again this opportunity to uh, talk on this platform. And I should also thank uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor sir, uh, for keeping me uh, reading, which uh, nowadays we teachers are seldomly doing that kind of uh, reading he has made me to do in the last uh, 15 days. Uh, first, I started with reading constitution for that constitution, Tesarip Conclave, and then I started reading, uh, rereading the human rights uh, aspect. And uh, as apt to the human rights in a multi uh, polar world, what has been given as the topic for this discussion. Uh, uh, it is, uh, in fact, to my uh, I don't th I think that it is uh, yet to be a multipolar world. But it seems emerging, an emerging kind of multipolar world is obviously there. And uh, with the emergence of the countries like China, uh, Japan, or maybe India, uh, or uh, once the international alliances like NATO and they come into existence, they come into uh, a role of to play for them in the international politics, then it seems that it will be a multi multipolar world. And exactly uh, what I was also reading through, what the Honorable Vice Chancellor sir, has already quoted from Samuel, I just forgot the name. Uh, the perspective of uh, human rights seems to differ from uh, place to place, from time to time. So I think that the idea of human rights, as we, we uh, knew and we cherish that, it uh, sometimes it seems that it is an idea of the Western world, or and we assume that it is a European thing, uh, which gets into uh, the entire world to think of and to consider and to recognize certain basic rights, certain fundamental rights as human rights or certain natural rights. But uh, what we have uh, really witnessed is that the idea of, the, of human rights seems to be exposed in whatever happened in very recent past and it continues to be uh, since it, it is almost 75 years of this adoption of uh, UDHR but at times may it be Vietnam may it be Iraq may it be Libya may it be any other country Apart from having all those treaties, all those understandings, all those conventions, we find there are gross violation of human rights, basic human rights. So my take is that the assumption that 
the Western world is the epitome of human rights, lays shattered. In pursuit of my uh, further reading, as the title goes for this, or as the idea of this human rights, International Human Rights Day, is premised over dignity, freedom, and justice. I again take these two points, uh, this point of dignity. My uh, line of argument is that dignity cannot be without the basic human right, what we consider as a right to health. And what we have seen in the very recent past, due to that pandemic, what happened? The people who suffered a lot were those who were not having a medical insurance. So my question is, can health be monetized? Can health care be left in the hands of private sector? Because the most important part of any human right, and if we say that it is uh, involving dignity of an individual, how can we say, how can we safeguard that dignity without having and access to health care. And that seemed to be prevailing in all the countries, leave apart the developing or the least developed countries. The developed countries also face this problem. Those who suffered during that this pandemic were mostly elderly people and immigrants who were not having that particular, that kind of medical insurance, who were not able to either own that uh, to own that medical insurance maybe because of lack of documents in the case of immigrants whereas the old people also who were the citizens of that very developed country so this is something which bothers me and i think that in the multipolar world when we are talking of a multipolar world the standards needs to be fixed and that common standard uh, which we need to have may be done by the UN itself. Because if we, uh, if a particular Western idea considers something as a basic human right, there may be another country coming into the international scene which may not be considering that as a, as a human right. So a minimum standardization of human rights should be rethinked off, should be uh, considered and should be laid down. And the other part of any human right, what we discussed today, seems to be uh, uh, something which is never enforced by any world international institution. So we need to also work on that, that at least in this multipolar world, emerging multipolar world, I should say, we need to standardize the kind of human rights, the kind of those rights which we may consider as fundamental human rights. The second aspect, very recently, uh, I think day before yesterday, there was a news which said that India will be now exposed, very sooner will be exposed to unbearable heat wave. So this is again something which is related with the fundamental human rights. The entire world should work on these areas also because it is not only the rich country or only the poor country in the entire humankind will be suffering from this very climate change, this very effect of us or developed countries not taking care of their emissions. And if we say of these things that the countries who are uh, developed countries having all the resources should also cope up, should also look into the vulnerability of developing and least developed countries. So these are my takes, which I I would like to present that we need to think over those these areas, one of dignity, and dignity involves two aspects. One of, of access to health services, and second is to have a better environment to live in. Thank you. I think. I was able to convey what I thought. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. They were indeed your wise words. With this, I now invite on this virtual dais, Professor Saloni Tyagi Shavastava, the guest of honor for today's program as well. She's currently working as Assistant Professor of Law at Kalinga University, Raipur, 
Prior to joining Kalinga University, she was associated with Sri Ravatpura Sarkar University as assistant professor. And prior to the stint of hers at the academia, she was working as a legal manager with the India Institute of Air Hostesses and Hospitality Management and was also the associate attorney at Minecrest. Ma'am, I now invite you to address the gathering. Thank you so much, ma'am. First of all, I would like to pay my regards to Venkata Rao, sir, Vivekananda, sir, uh, Deepak Srivastava, sir, Uday Shankar, sir, Jale Saban, sir, and the organizing committee for having me here on the dice to share my views on such an amazing topic. Uh, so uh, when we talk about human rights specifically, uh, one thing which comes to my mind immediately, or I think, uh, you know, everybody thinks about one thing that is United Nations founding charter. And why I am mentioning this specific, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, term and uh, charter, because this is the charter which, uh, you know, mentions uh, the term human rights seven times in the charter, and uh, it made a way the promotion and protection of human rights, and it made you know a key, it made it a key purpose and guiding principle of the organization. And another document which comes to our mind is your uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was, uh, you know, being implemented in 1948, uh, which laid down the principle that actually brought the human rights into the realm of international law. And since then, this organization has uh, diligently uh, protected human rights and uh, through legal instruments and also on the ground activities. Uh, when we talk about human rights in the multipolar world, uh, first I would like to, uh, you know, give a brief of multipolarity, what it actually means. It is a distribution of power. That means when, uh, you know, it, 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 it refers to geopolitical distribution of power or situation uh, when, you know, uh, several powers tries to, you know, balance each other out. So uh, this is, uh, you know, the term which usually used to describe uh, when, one, when no one nation has overwhelming power over the others. Apart from that, uh, Jale Saban sir uh, quoted that COVID-19 actually uh, made us realized or I would say that uh, it has offered us vital lessons on basic nature and, uh, you know, uh, priorities of human rights. Uh, because uh, with COVID-19, uh, it resurgence is impacting socio-economic development, uh, especially in developing countries. And now it is it is very important that we need to give more attention uh, to economic, social, cultural, uh, you know, developmental and health rights of the people. Apart from COVID, recently uh, we all you know heard about UK, Ukraine and Russia war which has uh, you know this war has led to many documented uh, violations of human rights and international human humanitarian law uh, that should be a grave concern for us for all of us apart from that recently the australian government they are imposing sanctions on individuals uh, who are actually involved in um, let's say egregious human uh, rights violation and abuses uh, among them are, you know, uh, Iran's morality police and uh, uh, these sanctions, basically these sanctions, uh, you know, they are targeting grievous uh, human rights situation uh, where the perpetrators continue to act with impunity. Uh, Australian government kept calling on countries to exert their influence on Russia to end its illegal immoral war. So we have seen, we are, we have been looking into uh, the violations of human rights. We have seen how the countries are trying to impose sanction on other countries. But the one thing uh, I think uh, which will remain questionable, are the effects of uh, geopolitical power shifts on human rights in years to come. I think in order to uh, assess the influence of the group of emerging states on the international human rights order, First, what we need to do is we need to differentiate between its constituents. Like if we talk about Indonesia, it is very different from Saudi Arabia. And just like Mexico, it differs from Turkey. So they have a different, you know, diverging interest 
their beliefs are different uh, they hold different expectations about their role in global governance so uh, when we talk about uh, multipolar world some states might become active supporters of international human rights protection and others might use their growing influence just to frustrate its uh, you know its functionality so when it comes to attitude towards the human rights uh, or human rights regime uh, emerging states can uh, be roughly con conceptually divided into three clusters like they like they they can be divided into three clusters uh, where you know first cluster or first group is the one you know who wants to change the dominant rules of the current system they are the game changers who want to set new rules uh, and they want to uh, counter at the functionality of today's human rights bodies and uh, they want to set different rules as per their convenience and when we talk about second group you know it it, it is comprised of who are uh, you know uh, they have uh, they are neither supportive and uh, nor adverse to the regime but yes and they are uh, you know having holding a neutral attitudes towards human rights they, these states uh, you know uh, they are very much neutral in their perception of human rights and the last group as i said that there, there can be three clusters the last group which entails of its states that you know they act as responsible human right protagonist in domestic regional and uh, global governance structures uh stay uh, you know states in this specific groups can be or they are open to progressive interpretations of human rights willing to accept widening international criminal law and international norms specifically uh now when we talk about emerging states there are still in uh, you know uh, many in india brazil who still believe that human rights is just a western concept which is a mistake because human uh, human rights are not uh, it's not a concept of one specific area one specific country because it human rights are universal adaptations or aspirations which are uh, rooted in basic concepts of dignity as jere siban sir quoted that it, it is rooted in basic conception of dignity and when you talk about india we have rich tradition of tolerance and justice that promote these values and as emerging uh, global leaders we share uh, you know a responsibility towards shaping a new order a new global order which can be friendlier to human rights uh, apart from that uh, being uh, being a emerging global leader we should begin to uh, provide uh, you know the kind of inspirational leadership on human rights uh, that others have failed to do only then i think we can become the kind of uh, genuine superpower that that others have failed to do uh, because uh, many emerging states like when we talk about world many emerging states are there who uh, yet you know they have not uh, capitalized on their potential to become international human rights promoters uh so uh, we have seen that uh, uh, violations are there countries are trying to uh, put sanction uh, to in in order to save the human rights but in the end what we need to look into is what is the way out how we can uh, promote the human rights how we can uh, help uh, the countries to you know safeguard the human rights of individuals so uh, 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 um, sorry as per my uh, thinking i think emerging liberal states you know they they can prove to be a crucial actor uh, in mediating the diverging interest of traditional powers and emerging global south they 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 will hold conflicting views uh, views on essential aspects of the human rights regime and its universal claims the coming decades will show whether these emerging liberal states are both willing and able to help to bridge the normative gaps that currently exist between more progressive and conservative powers that uh, hold a lot of sway in today's geo uh, geopolitical power or clashes in places like syria 
Yemen, Ukraine. We have recently seen Ukraine Russia war. So I think the future of the international human rights uh, regime lies in their hands. Um, that is all I just wanted to uh, talk about that emerging states. Uh, liberal states are the ones who can uh, work for the international human rights regime and uh, they can promote them and they can actually work on it. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an indeed a great or matter of honor and pride to invite on this dais Professor Dr. R. Venkata Rao, former Vice Chancellor of NLSIU Bangalore, a man who needs no introduction and certainly a formal introduction shall not do justice to highlight the various facets of his personality. Nonetheless, I will humbly attempt to do so. Professor Dr. R. Venkata Rao has been the Vice Chancellor of NLSIU Bangalore from 2009 to 2019. He has over 42 years of teaching and research experience and has many accolades to his credits, including the prestigious Professor N. R. Madhava Menon Best Law Teacher Award for the year 2018, awarded, awarded by the Society of Indian Law Firms and Menon Institute of Legal Advocacy and Training for his outstanding services to the promotion of quality legal education. He has also been awarded with the Attorney General K. Parasaran Award in recognition of his outstanding scholarship in legal education. He has distinction of serving the various statutory bodies of almost all the law schools in the country, including the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, Indian Law Institute at New Delhi, and the Indian Institute of Public Administration. He has also been a member of different committees in the Bar Council of India and is associated with the prestigious bodies like UPSC, State Service Commission, UGC, NAC, amongst others. Sir, it is indeed an honor to have your august presence amongst us. May I now invite you to this virtual dais for your keynote address on human rights in a multipolar world. Thank you, Ankita. Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. You are audible. Uh, I'm in a public place. I don't think there is much disturbance to you. Okay. <laughs> because uh, in order to save time, I have stayed back in the public place uh, in my enthusiasm to not to let down you. Okay. And uh, be that as it may, revered Vice Chancellor Professor Vivekanandan, my fellow panelists, uh, Professor Jelis Subhan, Professor Saloni, and of course, the custodian of the university, Professor Uday Shankar, and the representatives of tomorrow's India, I would say Ankita Singh, ladies and gentlemen. When Ankita said that uh, our chief guest would be there to deliver the keynote, it was yes. When I received the invitation from Professor Vivekananda, I was in a hamlet in Delma as to whether to accept the request to deliver the keynote at least. Then I was in a pensive mood. And Normally, your wives come to your rescue to protect your human rights. And when I was in a pensive mood, my wife came and said, why are you in a pensive mood? Normally, you'll be very jovial. I said, my good friend, Professor Vivekanandan, has asked me to be the chief guest and deliver the keynote address. And she said, OK, you are invited to deliver the keynote address. You, we come from a family of music lovers. Yes, I said. Then don't you know in a musical instrument, the keynote is the lowest instrument? And Professor Vivekananda very practically has asked you to deliver the keynote address, which would be the lowest note. That gave me the courage. And here I am this evening, thrown onto the dais into the distinguished company of all these people to share my thoughts. But let me first congratulate HNLU for having conceptualized this idea because human rights will always have locomotion only when they have eloquent spokespersons. And the best way of making each student of earth a foot soldier of human rights and an eloquent spokesperson is by disseminating human rights culture. And when I say we have to disseminate human rights culture, one should understand the basic difference between culture and civilization. Civilization is what we do, but culture is what we are, what we are inherently. And human rights fail where feeling for life fails. So, let it be in a multipolar world at the global level, 
or let it be at, at a multi-layer society at the local level as in India. Remember, human rights would obviously fail when feeling for life fails. So that feeling for life would be generated today thanks to initiative taken by Professor Vivekanandan. Before I go to my assigned topic, I will also tell you the best definition of human rights I have come across is not Professor. from the context of Human Rights Act 1993. Professor. Not Professor. from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Professor. From the uh, Pakistan Human Rights a... Activist. Professor. Aslama. Can I intervene for a said, second? Just twist uh, the words, please. she said. Sir? Human right means the right to be human. If you understand that, human rights are protected. And ask for yourself the question, how many human beings are you treating in a human way? How many human beings are you treating in a subhuman way? How many human beings are you treating in a inhuman way, both in your private life and public life? That's the best vindication of human rights, she said. We did that, Professor Vivekananda had made my job much, much easier by speaking about the multipolar world and the role of the United Nations. But I just, I would like to add to that. The conceptualization and articulation of human rights took place in the first half of the 20th century. And the first half of the 20th century, which saw two world wars, had seen five interesting phenomena. And those are, first one is the prevalence of colonial rule, number one. Number two is the rise of authoritarian governments in many countries. Number three, establishment of fascist, oppressive, barbarous regimes in some countries. Number four, rise of national liberation movements. And number five, movements for democracy and social progress. These were the five distinct features in the first half of the 20th century that resulted in articulation of human rights. And you had the Second World War where people said that must be a war to end all wars. And we have United Nations which says to save the succeeding generation from the scourge of war. But Professor Vivekananda wonderfully said multipolar world. Look at the chart of United Nations. It says maintenance of international peace and security. It doesn't say promotion of international peace and security. Even today, the primary world in the UN Charter is maintenance of international peace and security. That means maintenance of status quo. The status quo that was prevalent in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, which was advantageous to Eurocentric powers, was the main theme of United Nations Charter, maintenance of international peace and security. Obviously, you had the genial seeds of polar, multipolarism that. Then the second question one should understand is, when the United Nations was established, there were 55 member states. Today, you have more than 194. So where were these 139 nations then? They were in the colonial yoke. And they were liberated. And they were mostly Afro-Asian states, what we call G77, like that, like that. And do you mention about the human rights of groups of people in these 139 Afro-Asian states in the United Nations so-called Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Therefore, people now are questioning the universality of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. How universal is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Are we required to change the narratives that are capable of bridging the different gaps that underlie the politics of human rights? What are those gaps? North, South. The second one is Professor Vivekananda is beautifully referring to individual and collective, which resulted in the distinction between civil and political on the one hand and social and economic and cultural on the other. And two of my fellow panelists focused on dignity. And today the question that he asked is, how do you define that dignity? Dignity means every human being shares the same nature, and consequently should enjoy equal moral status. Every human being shares the same nature, in spite of race, in spite of color, in spite of ethnicity. And therefore, he must enjoy the equal moral status. Is it happening? That's a question that needs to be examined. And the so-called multipolarism 
but you'll find it beautifully by Sashi Teru in his latest book, Global World Disorder. That is the title of the book. He doesn't call it Global World Order. Sashi Teru and Sami Sun have come out with a book and they have titled it Global World Disorder. And he says the new world disorder had five or six important features. The first one is, of course, multipolar world. But in that multipolar world, there is now an increase in the ascendancy of inward looking attitudes. People have started looking inward and Trump afterwards, okay, and reassertion of national prerogatives. Globalization is today, please remember, ladies and gentlemen, is being confronted by economic nationalism. Globalization is being confronted by economic nationalization. Nationalism. And in the world today, you have emergence of two types of groups. On the one hand, isolationist groups versus global groups. Number two, conservative groups versus liberal forces. Madam was referring to liberal democracy that was emerging in India. So isolationist versus global, liberal versus conservative. And also a very important thing is attempts are being made to cripple the United Nations. Sashi Teru says, United Nations is the best example of global governance without global government. Global governance without global government. But global governance would be possible only when you have humanized state sovereignty. Now, do you have humanized state sovereignty? For sense. Therefore, these are the emerging parameters in the contemporary world disorder that spell doom for declaration of human rights and promotion of human rights. The next point I wanted to share with you is, as a result of this multipolar world, look at the significant chronological developments in the celebration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 1998, you had the 50th anniversary. 2008, you had the 60th anniversary. 2018, you had the 70th anniversary. Then, next year, you'll be having 75th anniversary. So this year is being observed as 74th anniversary. And in 1998, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights will be celebrated with the theme, Human Rights for All, at the beginning, Malaysian Prime Minister asked, how universal are human rights? Because there is no mention about women's rights in any of the 30 rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it was pointed out that most of the women have their human rights in the private spaces. But Universal Declaration of Human Rights speaks only about human rights in public places. And therefore, the, is there not gender discrimination? So year long, the celebrations went on. And you know, at the beginning of the year in 1998, the theme was human rights for all. It was changed to all human rights for all at the end of 1999. That means they realized human rights were being cornered and therefore all human rights for all. Ten years down, the River Thames and Danube, we had the 60th anniversary of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the theme that was taken up in 2008 was, and dignity and justice for all. That means they have realized dignity was conspicuous by its absence, and dignity could not be bartered with, because they realized the truth of Martin Luther King's dictum, that if you seek peace, you have to cultivate justice. And the best way of cultivating justice is protection and promotion of human rights. And with impunity, dignity has been violated. Therefore, they took the theme and dignity and justice for all. And then 2018, 70th anniversary, the theme that was adopted was, let us make human rights a fact and not an idealistic dream. That means 70 years after the journey of universal declaration of human rights, they realized that human rights still continue to be an idealistic dream. 
the poster said, let's make it a fact. But then came COVID and Madam was referring to. And when Human Rights Declaration Day was celebrated in 2020, the theme that was adopted was recover better and stand up for all. That means there cannot be selective application of human rights. They beautifully said the virus does not distinguish between human beings, but the impact of the virus discriminates between human beings. That means uh, COVID ha had its impact to a greater extent on poorer sections who were marginalized. Though the virus did not differentiate between human beings, the impact differentiated, and therefore they said they, you stand up for all. And in 2022, the theme that was chosen was from dignity and justice for all of 2020, they said dignity, freedom, and justice for all. Because they found that in most of the states, because of the multipolar dimensions, freedom was being touched. And that is the theme in 2022. And they said year long celebrations should be there. And therefore, in this multipolar world, when you look at the realization of human rights, one should go back to Elena Roosevelt's statement when the universal question of human rights was given to us. Elena Roosevelt said, the genial seats of the Second World War were laid in educational institutions and schools of Germany. When, for two decades, a systematic campaign of hatred was taught and a systematic campaign of Aryan superiority was taught to the school-going children that when they became adults, they became Nazis, they became fascists. Therefore, human rights must be nurtured and nourished in the nurseries and education institutions, etc. And today, it's an celebration and observation of human rights is one of the best examples of the human rights being the number of natural and nourishing education institutions. One more personal experience I'll share with you when you discuss eloquently about human rights in a multipolar world or in a multi-layered society like Indian society. Once when we attended the human rights seminar for five days, on the last day, a question was asked to us, who is the greatest violator of human rights? And we were asked to give the answer. All of us answered on the paper. And some of us said police, some of us said army, some of us said X, Y, Z, B. And then the report here, when he submitted all those things before the chairperson, the chairperson said, ladies and gentlemen, None of you could understand the dynamics of human rights because human rights are not violated by defense forces, not violated by police, but the greatest violator of human rights is family as an institution. Because the unequal distribution of values starts in the family. The first lessons in life are taught in a family whereby preferential treatment is given to some. Therefore, what is required at the moment is uh, it, the spread of human rights culture. And let me also end with a caveat. Let the world be multipolar. Let the world be bipolar. Let the world be unipolar. When at the end of the Cold War, when Berlin Wall collapsed, when people thought the only superpower was the United States, one jurist said, no, there is another superpower, and that superpower is public opinion. And remember, public opinion would be one superpower always, the other superpowers would be really. And therefore, for protection of human rights, public opinion is required. The next point I wanted to focus is the technology and the deprivation of human rights. Professor Vidayakan is an expert in that. We live in an age of post-industrial revolution. And people say technology endangers human rights, artificial intelligence and robots. And the youngsters are the most disconnected lot, where you have alienation, frustration, aggression. 
and therefore in fourth industrial revolution days we should understand the importance of human rights by stressing on one very important factor that human brain can be replicated by robots but not your human soul and not your human heart heart is full of passion and compassion soul is full of creativity and human rights will be best guaranteed only when there is a functioning heart atul bihari vajpayee our former prime minister beautifully in one hindi poem said internet may be important but one should always remember inner net is more important than internet inner net is more important than internet and that inner net is about the heart to throb about the middle stick to promote the human rights culture and as long as the culture is protected human rights will not be endangered otherwise whatever be the polarization of the world remember human rights narrative would remain more a rhetoric than a reality and the political subsection of the human rights would prevail over the objective of human rights with these few words i take leave of you thanking you once again but before winding up professor vivekananda is very famous for telling anecdotes so i will wind up my keynote at us also with an anecdote that was told to me by my school teacher on human rights day he said this if you talk of future of human rights whether human rights will be alive or dead i would only give you one example he said he said a school teacher was taking a lesson and he completed the lesson and then a student got up and said sir i would like to ask you a question yes he said please ask he showed his hand the hand was empty then he removed a small bird from his pocket and he kept that bird in the hand he closed it then he said by the respect to esteem with sir can you tell me whether the bird is alive or dead the little fellow wanted to catch his teacher on the wrong foot if the teacher says the bird is alive he will crush it to death and say the bird is dead if the teacher says the bird is dead he will simply open the palm and say the bird is alive either way the teacher would be caught on the wrong foot but he said the experienced person as amazon says young people think old are fools but old know young are fools but they don't say that so the teacher was smiling then the student got be curious why are you smiling sir when i asked you a question then he said the bird is alive or dead as you like it to be the bird is alive or dead as you like it to be human rights are alive or dead as we like them to be please remember that nobody from without would come to the rescue of human rights thank you very much professor vivek for giving this wonderful opportunity to me okay and it is my privilege to have shared the platform with all of you for a remember an interactive happy dialogue on human rights on this moment just today thank you very much thank you so much sir that was indeed a very engaging and an inspiring session we now open the floor for an interactive session may i request the gathering to ask precise questions you may even post the questions in the chat box yeah Uh, sir, we have a question from uh, Dr. Papa Rao. He's an associate professor. He's asking, uh, CSR also manages some human rights issues, but does not explicitly present them as such. Can you throw some light on this, sir? Please repeat the question. Sir, he's asking, 
that CSR also manages some human rights issues, but does not explicitly present them as such. Can you throw some light, sir? Now from human rights, what am I guess, sir? Uh, CSR, so corporate social responsibility. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. CSR, achha, achha, achha. Now I, yes, Papa Rao is a man of business law, okay. <laughs> Social responsibility should be that of everyone. Corporate social responsibility does not mean abdication of state responsibility. Please don't forget that. Is it it? And therefore, corporate social responsibility also includes within its umbrella, within its rubric, the protection and promotion of human rights. And one of the avowed objectives of corporate social responsibility is to protect human rights in a positive way. Please remember not to pay compensation after a disaster takes place. Please remember, that's not protection of human rights. See, absence of disease is not health. Health has a positive connotation. And likewise, protection of human rights, Madam was telling, my other panelists were telling dignity, remember, which should never be bought that way. And the corporate social responsibility means responsibility towards the stakeholders and not shareholders. Stakeholders are wider and bigger in number, including the denizens, the rank and file, and their human rights need to be taken care of. Okay? Thank you, sir. Sir, we have one more question uh, from Mr. Ganesh Bhatt. He's asking, what is the status of Honorable Court's direction to install CCTV camera throughout the country's police stations, most if the human rights violations are happening in the premises of police stations? This is an age-old dilemma and debate about the contours of technology. Okay, are we bartering away our dignity? Okay, and that's the reason why Professor Upendra Bakshi says it is foolish to talk of human rights because we live in a post human world. None of us is a human being. He has come out with a book, Human Rights in a Post Human World, published by Oxford University Press. That means we are all dehumanized. Isn't it? Let me tell you, even the youngsters, when they browse. They don't have the patience. They say, yes, 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 without understanding anything. Because they are interested in going to the next step. And they are not in a position to understand that they are entering into what you call a Faustian contract. That means contract that was entered by Dr. Faustus. Remember, Christopher Marlowe's Faustus with the Mephistopheles. You are entering into a contract with the devil. Sorry? Immediate pleasures for 24 years, but after 24 years, your soul will be in hell. Now, that's what exactly is happening these days, okay? And therefore, that's a very interesting question. But remember, I will again say eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. As long as we are vigilant, nobody can take it away, okay? Bye. Sir, so we have one more question from uh, Mr. Saket Tiwari. He's asking, why are the human rights organization not doing anything in the matter related to Ukraine-Russia war as such rights of many people are being violated there? Now, now uh, that's an oversimplification to say that they are not doing anything. Okay. See, Ukraine Russia conflict. One positive contribution I would say is it has not conflagrated into a third world war as yet. Maybe because of nuclear deterrence and other things. Okay. And therefore, the, it is being contained. But unfortunately, publicity is given more to an accident 
For example, when the train comes on time, nobody reports in the newspaper. But when the train meets with an accident, it's in the headlines. So if the train runs for 364 days, nobody reports. But on the 365th day when there's an accident, therefore the contra indications are published. And number of nations have played diplomatic role of the screen to prevent the worst possible escalation of Ukrainian conflict. Remember, in fact, uh, more than Ukrainian conflict, I would say in Russia, Georgia war, there was greater impact of cyber warfare. So, so where can we it? It was a disaster. Okay. Therefore, uh, I feel that agencies have been playing an effective role, remember, in containing those things. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, if anybody has any further questions, we have time for one more question. No problem. You see, you can send the questions not to the chat back to my mailbox. Right, okay. sir. I will never feel that my human right is violated. Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you. Okay. That's very kind of you, sir. Uh, with this, we conclude the interactive session for today's program. May I now invite Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan, sir, for a, for to share his concluding remarks. Thank you, thank you, uh, Anita. Uh, let me first uh, thank Professor uh, Rao, in spite of uh, certain uh, what I call as a, not having a cozy place to talk, but still he managed to deliver his uh, lecture right uh, uh, of uh, touching on various aspects and and uh, and he also touched on uh, the other deans who spoke about uh, you know individual human rights he brought in the latest dimension of technology and human rights apart from the traditional discourse which is about human rights in terms of war in terms of power structure of establishment and those who are governed, he brought in a third dimension. It is not between humans and humans. And he also brought technology as something which is assuming uh, proportions, which is also having a, a, a impact in terms of human rights. So very interesting, uh, as uh, I do a lot of work on this, uh, the, the good side of technology is that it does not segregate humans in terms of race in terms of caste, in terms yes. of gender. Whether Ambani goes to an ATM machine or his driver goes to an ATM machine, ATM machine does not discriminate any one of them. But a bank manager will discriminate. That is very, very sure when you enter a bank manager. So the question, sometimes I find only thing, artificial intelligence is not shaped the way humans were thinking all along the centuries then artificial intelligence itself will acquire these dimensions. If artificial intelligence is left free as a technology neutral stuff, then obviously what you call as the, the uh, bad and ugly side of human beings will not get reflected because uh, the good, bad, ugly is part of our you know evolution, evolutionary process. So the, uh, the take today is what uh, Professor was talking, whether it is uh, unipolar, which turned into a bipolar, into a multipolar world. The question is, the net balance sheet will depend upon uh, how do we sensitize and how do we inculcate these things? That's very important. In that sense, his caution on technology that it uh, should that we should not get carried away is a very relevant thing because I know one thing among the senior vice chancellors, I always found. Uh, uh, the person Vice Chancellor was very adept in handling technology or the fastest response always used to come from Professor Venkatrao. Sometimes <laughs> I thought long, whether he is answering some artificial intelligence software is answering. Sometimes I used to wonder because I take time to respond at times for messages, but I used to get uh, his response, be it official one or unofficial uh, message of a joke. I used to get a very quick response. So no way to tell that uh, Professor Rao and uh, technology are distant cousins, but at the same <laughs> time, he, he is uh, cautioning about this one aspect, which is uh, one of the thing I do understand 
his own law school that is uh, national law school i saw in that thing that they started a course on artificial and intelligent and human rights there is a very interesting you know take on that and so that should also be a new dimension which uh, which takes on the world because in the world there was a division called haves and have nots which was one of the important marxian concept for human right violation is haves and have nots and now we add a dimension of knows and no nots in terms of digital world so that is a new dimension so thanks for highlighting this so i would like to say that uh, as you said it's uh, it come in a time where universities are all finished and you know tensely waiting for exam results in that case still we are able to do this program today and uh, importantly thanks to both the deans you know uh, 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 professor jelis and professor saloni from itm and the kalinga joining us today and then you know partnering in doing this program and also other colleagues who have taken uh, initiative to you know to be part of this so this will be my uh, you know uh, closing remark i leave it to the anchor thank you sir with this we come towards the conclusion of today's inspiring and en engaging xrka webinar on international human rights day may i now invite dr deepak shrivastava sir associate professor and dean ug law at hnlu to deliver the vote of thanks thank you professor adita a very good evening to one and all present on this virtual platform as we know we are discussing about the human rights all men are created equals that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness respected honorable vice chancellor sir i i would get that Professor Vivek, yes, sir. You were referring to Rousseau. Yes. That is born free. Okay. Yes. Everywhere is in chains. Okay. But can we say today's technology, man is born free, but he is everywhere in digital chains. <laughs> huh? How to extricate ourselves out of digital chains? Okay. True. 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 Sir. Can you? Come on, the paper of that. Okay, thank you. Professor Nipak, yes, yes, sir. So, respected honourable Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan, respected our most distinguished chief guest of the today's program, Professor Dr. R. Venkata Rao, sir, heads of the Law Law Department, Kalinga University and ITM University, respected registrar, sir. Respected deans of the university, members of the teaching fraternity of HNLU, dear students of HNLU, Kalinga University and IT University, ladies and gentlemen. I consider it a great privilege to propose a vote of thanks to all who have made it convenient to participate in this celebration of Human Rights Day organized by Hidayatullah National Law University. We are deeply grateful to the respected professor, Dr. Venkata Rao, sir, for accepting the request on a very short time to be the chief guest of this program for an enlightening lecture, sir. I thank you for accepting the request to be the chief guest of the function and your address, sir. I take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to the respected honorable vice chancellor, sir, for presiding over the program and his opening remarks, sir. You are the true motivator and able mentor, and due to this, we often engage ourselves in academic deliberation. We are extremely grateful to you, sir. I am also express my sincere thanks to the head of the departments of his School of Law, ITM University and Kalinga University, for your valuable thoughts on the subject. I am thankful to Honorable Registrar, sir, Dean of Hidayatullah National Law University, very specific uh, convener digital team, Dr. Uh, Ms. Anita Singh, for creating the platform and making all the arrangement to make this particular webinar successful. I'm also thankful to the staff members who are engaged and the students of Hidayatullah National University, ITM University, 
and Kalinga University for participating and attending this program. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, sir. With this, we come towards the conclusion of today's program. With the permission of the dignitaries, I would like to end today's session. Thank you. Thank you, sir.